Hi gang, Donna here. Today I have the pleasure of talking to Emily Thoreau Threat. We're going to have a very interesting conversation about grief and loss and how to manage and move through it. It's a very personal conversation and one that I actually meant that I did tear up during. Um, she lost two husbands kind of the same way I lost mine, um, dealing with cardiac issues as well as kidney problems. We talk about being caregivers. We talk about finding a purpose afterwards. We talk about trying to find joy. So I hope you enjoyed it. And I hope if you are going through a loss that this helps you. Hi, Emily. How are you doing today? I'm wonderful. How are you? I'm doing good. I'm doing good. And you are coming from Hawaii, correct? You were talking to us yes. from Hawaii. And what yes, part of I live Hawaii? in Maui. Awesome. Awesome. So how's the weather there? Uh, beautiful. <laughs> Blue skies, uh, high 70s, low 80s. Oh, nice. Nice. We're, we're at 90 here. So that's why oh. I normally I wouldn't talk about the weather, but you know, you're in Hawaii. <laughs> yeah. Uh, 90 in Chicago is a lot. <laughs> It is, and it's. We had like a spit of a rainstorm, so it's humid out too. So yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. But we're not here to talk about that today. We're here to talk no. about something that most everyone has dealt with, especially in the last year, which is grief. So, tell me, you know, before we ever started talking here, you had told me that you had lost um, two husbands, and. Most of my listeners know that, yes, I lost my husband. And the reason we have the Better Two podcast, because one thing in your statement, and this is why I'm saying this, in your, your interview, that pre-interview that you did with me, you stated that it was better to have had them and then lost them. And that's kind of what I told my husband as well. You know, when we, before we got together, he was sick. And I'm like, you know, it's better to love you and lose you than never to have loved you at all. And so that somehow this all morphed into this podcast with the Better Two moment. So tell me about you know, these two men that were your husbands? Uh, they were great people. I was married to Jacques for 22 years and we had tons in common uh, and lots of differences too. He was a philosophy professor and I taught writing at the university and uh, we both loved theater. So we did a lot of theater things together and, and really enjoyed our lives. Excuse me, and sir. <laughs> he had um he was dealing with um heart issues through most of our marriage he was a lot older than i was and he ended up the last two years of our marriage i was taking care of him with his heart issues which turned into renal failure also and and after two years he died so and when he died i had no intention of ever having another relationship. I did, our relationship was so good and I didn't feel unmarried. That was one thing that I, nobody had said anything like that to you before. They always say till death do your part, but just cause he died didn't mean I stopped loving him or I was not feeling connected to him. So it was a little bit of a challenge when I actually did meet Ron because I wasn't quite sure how I could love Two people at the same time but i figured it out and ron and i had 10 wonderful years together and he too in the last uh two years of his life i took care of him with congestive heart failure and renal failure the same thing that Jacques had so I had a lot of the training and in, in how to do that he actually was dealing with that for longer than two years with the last two years he had lived in hawaii a long time before i met him and he said he really wanted to return to hawaii for his final days so this last two years we spent here on maui uh, and spent together and it it was it was good because he really taught me how to live in the moment and the importance of um joy in my life that just because he was going through the issues that he was going through was no reason for me to not be happy. So when we focused on the, the moment and living in the moment, it was easy to uh, love and, and be happy in the moment. And that, that really helped me through there. But after he passed, uh, I taught writing for, for years. So I turned to writing 
to help me just writing for myself. And the more I wrote, the more different ways I found it that really helped me. And I thought I need to share this. So I started uh, a group here on Maui for people to come to my house and they, they came at first once a month and we'd write together and share our writing and got to be good friends. And they, they said, you know, once a month isn't enough. Can't we come twice a month? So <laughs> we did that up until the pandemic and nobody was going to anybody's houses yeah, anymore. Yeah. But I've been doing it online since then. And all the things that I uh, was learning led to me creating this this book, Loving and Loving Your Way Through Grief, that is is not just my personal story. It's it's not a memoir. It does have things about my experience in it, but I also interviewed a lot of other people with their experiences with uh, dealing with grief and and uh, the loss of loved ones, and just loss in general, and. So they, there's 26 chapters, each one on a different topic. And I talk about how grief relates to whatever that topic is. And then at the end, I have a practice that people can actually do to help themselves uh, move forward in their grieving and to be happy at the same time. And, and that's a trick because everybody, you know, everybody looks at grief as this linear thing and it's not. Um, I can look at myself a year ago and, and think that I was handling it much better then than I have in the recent past. When the, when the anniversary rolled around, it was a lot harder to deal with. And I don't know why the change, but it's just how it handled it, you know? Yeah, it's not unusual, you know, and everybody handles it in their own way. And you, you can feel like you've really got it together, but nobody's seeing inside your head, you know, and, and they, they don't realize and, and people have expectations of you. Like at the beginning, they're expecting you to just be in tears all the time. And, and a lot of times they kind of shy away from talking to you or, or anything because they, they don't want to deal with the loss themselves. But it's not unusual for things to come up later on. Um, for instance, yesterday was my birthday, and usually it's no big deal. But I just kind of fell down a little rabbit hole, remembering all the, the wonderful things that Ron used to do for my birthday. My birthday was always a big deal for him. And yesterday, my birthday wasn't a big deal. Yeah. <laughs> and yeah. and it, it just I just was really missing him yesterday. So it, it, it will come and go ebb and flow forever but now i feel like i can i can deal with it i can handle it i can write about it that always helps the the interesting thing because i am a writer as well um before my husband died somehow i started writing about a character losing her husband mm. and dealing with that whole process and i mean i should preface with the september he died last june and the september beforehand we had gotten you know his cardiologist tells me after a stint that he's on borrowed time Nobody bothers to tell him. They bother oh. to tell me. And I'm like, before he leaves the hospital, I'm like, somebody needs to tell him because I don't want to be the one to tell him. I'm not trained to tell him. I, I'm dealing with my own stuff. And I started making sure he saw friends that he wanted to see. But back to the writing, it was like, you know, he's going to the bathroom and I'm sitting here writing, bawling my eyes out about this woman losing her husband. And mind you, my husband's right there. And I, he come by, he's like, hi. And I wipe my eyes. I'm like, oh, hi, you know, everything's fine. And I go back to writing and start crying again. So I think maybe initially that's why when it happened, because for me, there wasn't just his death. There was the trauma of it because he, he died multiple times because he died in the car with me. They got him back an hour later and, you know, he died in the ER and then they came back and then he finally I had to end up pulling the plug because he had been without oxygen for his brain had been without oxygen for over an hour. So oh. there's no real. Um, but, you know, how do you, you know, when you're dealing with that and you're in that moment, it's like. It just it's overwhelming and you 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 feel hopeless. And I mean, when you were talking about renal failure, yeah, he was he was a type one diabetic who had renal failure he you know he would tell he would proudly state i was the poster boy for a bad diabetic mm -hmm. when he was first diagnosed he lost 100 pounds and then somebody told him how he could game his insulin to have a donut and to be to eat poorly and he loved food so he learned how to play the system and you know going back to that statement yeah he was losing his sight and it was mm -hmm. like okay i have to 
I had to learn how to become a caregiver. And that's the one thing nobody really talks about either, especially when you're dealing with somebody that you love so much and you're willing to be a caregiver. And then, so that becomes your role and you don't, it was after my husband passed and I'm sure you've heard this because you've been in a similar situation. My, my primary care doctor, which was also his said to me, she goes, do you realize how much anxiety you were under? How much stress? But as a caregiver in that situation, you don't think about it because you're taking care of the person you love and you'll do anything in the world to be there for them. So you were talking about renal failure. I mean, my husband was on dialysis. Was your, were your two husbands on dialysis? Yes. Mm -hmm. And that's a, that's a whole nother process in, in agony to see them hooked up to that and to see, oh, yeah. see how they are after the treatment. I don't think anybody ever really talks about that. No, you know? they don't. They, when, when they were talking about uh, Jacques eventually needing to go on dialysis, I was seeing how he was, he was failing and things weren't, weren't going right for him. I said, can't you start him on dialysis? And they said, no, we don't want to start him on dialysis until we absolutely have to. Because all I'd heard about dialysis was it seemed like a panacea that he'd get it and he'd feel better. Mm -hmm. And um, he had moments of feeling better, but <laughs> mostly he, he had uh, serious problems with it. And he, he ultimately, um, He'd been in the hospital again for, for a long period of time, and they finally were releasing him for issues with his heart. And he had fallen uh, before he went into the hospital in, in a parking lot, and we lived in the high desert. And he, I, I had, nobody would come because it was so hot. I was screaming for somebody to come help, and nobody would come. So I finally had to just gently lie him down because I couldn't carry mm -hmm. him anyplace mm -hmm. and run inside the business and say, call 911 and come help me. Well, yeah. in that time that he was on the ground, he got second degree burns all down his back through his clothes. <sighs> And, and he, in the process of the fall, had ripped the skin off the side of his foot. Well, that meant that for the rest of his life, I was going to be doing dressing changes. Yeah, yeah. And when they sent me home from the hospital, they gave me enough to do it like once, but said, you're going to have to get your own. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so I, I stopped on the way home at a um, supply store where I could get that. And I said, please just sit here in the car for just a minute. I'm just going to run in and get this stuff. I'll be right back out. And by the time I got to the back of the car, he'd gotten out of the car and fallen on the sidewalk and broken his hip. <sighs> and having to have the hip surgery, the anesthetic for the hip surgery was what uh, made his kidneys ultimately fail. So yeah. he had to go on dialysis right then. Yeah. So there's, there's just things that that you don't know that you need to be prepared for when you're going through this whole process. Oh yeah. And it's, it's really good when there, you can have somebody you can talk to or, or, or lean on a little bit and afterwards too, to be able to talk to somebody who, who, who knows what you're talking about. Like I can say something to you about heart failure and dialysis and you absolutely understand. Well, like that moment you were describing about, calling for help and nobody's coming. I mean, we left dialysis. He felt like his sugar was low. So we stopped at Burger King, which was less than five minutes away. We're in the drive through. I think he had personally, I think he had a stroke. They could never really fully tell me, of course. Um, but we're in, we park because they need to cook what he wanted. So I have the sugary tea. I'm like drink. I had given him an apple. And the whole reason for the food is because of the pandemic, mask on at dialysis, nothing to eat, nothing oh. to drink. And That's he was, crazy. he was on it for like four hours and 45 minutes. Yeah. So, oh, wow. so he gets in the car and I mean, like I said, he loved food. First thing he says to me is Popeye's has their chicken sandwich on special if you use their app. So everything seems fine. You know, he tells me he loves me and everything's fine. We kiss and I'll we get in the parking lot go through drive through park. I'm telling him to drink. He's like, I am drinking. He's not drinking. I know something's up and I'm like, John, are you okay? I've dealt with his low blood sugar. And when he turns his head to the side and just collapses on me, I'm on the phone dialing 911. I'm out of the car. Cause they're like, can you move him out of the car? No, I can't. I mean, there's, there's no way I can, if I move him, he's going to fall out the car and bust his head open. And I'm, I'm in a Burger King parking lot. There's a Midas muffler store right there. 
There's people outside. I am screaming for help. I'm on the phone with 911. Not a soul. Nobody comes over until the police show up in the ambulance. And then the people at Burger King come out and, you know, then everybody wants to help. And it's like in that moment, so I know that moment you're talking about and you feel so damn helpless. Excuse my language, but you're yeah. so, so helpless. And you're like, all you want to do is fix what's going on and you can't. Yeah. And nobody, yeah. and unless you've been there, you, you don't understand that experience. Yeah, I, I when um, when Jacques ultimately died, he'd been working on a revision of his ethics textbook, which had been in publication for years, and the revision was about a year overdue because he just was having such a hard time doing it. We'd been working on it together. We finally got it done, and he was so excited. It was the first time we could submit it electronically, so we submitted it, called his editor in New York, had a great celebration, and then it was time for him to go to dialysis. And so I, we, I, he was having a really hard time talk, walking. He it usually wasn't, he had a walker, but it wasn't that hard for him, but he was having a really hard time. And I got him out to the car. I had the, the door open. He sat down on the seat and he looked up at me and he said, oh, and then the word that begins with S and ends with T with this look on his face and he was gone. So and there's something similar. Yeah, and I, I went to, to, I was afraid he was going to fall, so yeah. I went to hold on to him, and he slid down between the, the seat and the dashboard, mm -hmm. so he was stuck. There was no way I could move him to go any place, and I know he didn't want to be resuscitated, but I had to I know. do something, I know. so I, I called 911, and they, they came, and all the firemen together eventually were able to get him out of the car, but it was, it was really hard. And then of course they started CPR because they showed up and I'm like, mm -hmm. oh, don't do that. Cause he, his, he would, I know he was gone, right? When he said that I saw, saw yeah, him yeah. leave, he was gone, yeah. but his heart was, was fibrillating. And as long as his heart was still moving, they were continuing to do the CPR or even at, at the hospital. When I said he has a DNR, you know, you can quit. And they said, well, since we started. So John did, uh, John did not have a DNR and I think the most haunting thing that I still remember is walking besides him actually passing was when they brought me into the ER and the machine was doing the chest compressions. And I mean, going from the hospital, going from Burger King, one of my friends came and got me and I had, we had the dog in the car too at the time. She drove me to the hospital and on the way there, I called his sister and I called two other people and I'm like, John's gone. I know he's gone. And when I get to the hospital because of the pandemic, my friend, even because of the dog, she had to stay in the car. But even if we wouldn't have had the dog, she couldn't have come in. And they're like, take her to the family room. OK, so right there, you know, if they're taking me to the family room, he's gone. And so I'm on this phone with the sister and they come back and they're like, oh, no, he's back. I'm like, OK, well, this is good. And I have to say, and this is going to sound really bad for some people I know. When they brought me to the ER and the machine was doing the compressions, the first thing I did besides take his hand was take his wedding ring. And I, I wear it. I wear it on, you know, my other, my wedding ring's on this hand now. It's not that I'm not connected to him, not that I'm not married to him, but it's my way of doing this. And, you know, I'm like, is he going to be okay? You know, it's been almost an hour since he hasn't, well, we don't know. Rationally, my mind is sitting there going, he's gone. Even if they get him back, physically his mind is not going to be there mm -hmm. but i made the choice and this this is sound sounds bad to me i guess i made the choice to say okay well let's see we'll do the test they intubated him they put him under and then i had five days with him oh, and wow. it was it was a year during that five-day period it was a year that we had like the best week i had I had released my first book. I had a book signing and it's like, I don't want to pull the plug on that day. I don't want to tarnish that memory of what we had. And yes, I'm sorry, folks. Anyway, I knew this was going to happen. And it's okay. So, so, I mean, I had those days to say goodbye. The one thing I will say, and I'm sure grief for me has been a very weird thing because we didn't have kids and the pandemic. So there's been no 
funeral, there was no wake. There was talk of a party and we were going to do it when the anniversary of the passing, I was going to do it with his best friend. And now he pushed it back to his birthday, but I still don't know that I want to do it. And this is going to sound very selfish. And if anybody that I know is listening, I'm sorry, but I don't know that I want to put myself back in that position for to, to relive my grief, to relive my grief to, because here's the thing. And I don't think anybody realizes this about grief. We're going to celebrate his life, which deserves to be celebrated. But most of the people that are going to be at this party hadn't seen John in years. And that's fine. But they're going to go home and their life is going to be fine and normal. And nobody's going to be here for me to deal with my tears or my sadness or my loneliness. And so when they say to when they say that a funeral or a wake is for the living, I really do believe that's the case. John, I don't think my husband would want me to go through all that, even though I know it might be the right thing to do. I don't know that I want to put myself I, in there. Yeah, I don't know that there's a right or wrong thing to do in a situation like this. You do what you feel in your heart that you know is what you need to do for you. You're here. Mm -hmm. And you you need to be able to feel feel your best. Know, know that you're making the, the decisions that are in your best interest. And that's okay. And it nobody else is going through what you're going through. So they're opinions about it about celebration or not don't really matter and i think that's the that's the hard thing is we all have expectations you were talking about expectations earlier we have expectations of well how should you be the grieving widow well i i've said many a times and i posted a picture you know i can be on the podcast and i'm smiling and i'm all good because this is this is what i choose to do and nobody wants to see me upset but I can get off the podcast, take my makeup off and be back to where I was. You know, it, it's when you miss somebody and it's, this isn't my first rodeo in, in grief. Okay. Not that you needed to know this, but my mom committed suicide and I walked away from my stepkids at a certain point when my first marriage ended. And at that point I was like their mom. So those kids were my kids. So there was the oh, grief wow. of losing them, even though they were physically still in the world. There's still grief to that. It's not the same. Absolutely. And as you know, dealing with people with long-term illness, that's one type of grief. But then somebody committing suicide or dying in a car accident or dying in a freak accident, that's another type of grief because you're not prepared. And, and that being said, you can be prepared as much as you think you are with being told they're on borrowed time or they're sick. It still mm -hmm. doesn't prepare you. It still really doesn't. And that's right. And, and most of us don't even think about being prepared, even when we're dealing with taking care of somebody that you, you know has what the outcome is going to be. A, a few months after Ron died, his very, very good friend, who was uh, much younger than Ron, he, he called Ron dad. So it was, that was about what the age relationship was. And we were friends with him and his family, lived a couple blocks away from us, did a lot of things together. And they lived on the mainland and we moved to Maui. And he just, he, and he was fine. He, he didn't have any problems or anything and he just died. Just, and I was so concerned for his wife because I, I knew that I'd had time to think about things gradually. Mm -hmm. And then, then I'd been dealing with him for a while, but I know that she hadn't thought a thing about what she needed to do, who she needed to listen to, who she didn't need to listen to, and about how she needed to take care of herself. And especially because they were a very prominent family and people were just kind of all over the place. And that's not always <laughs> what yeah. you need in a situation like that. So I sat, sat down and, and wrote her just hours after I, he died, this letter that said who she needed to listen to, who she didn't need to, things that were important right now, things she could do later, that, that sort of thing in the letter. And I sent it to her and, and she later said how, how invaluable that advice was to her at that point. And after we had that conversation, I thought I got to do more. So I 
decided that I would send her something every week in the mail for the first year. And as I thought about it, I thought, well, I take pictures on Maui all the time because there's so much beauty over here just mm -hmm. on my phone. So I made 52 cards, one for each week for the year. And I thought, okay, now what am I going to put inside of them? So I thought, I, I got to brainstorm this before I, I start this because it's a big commitment. So it, I sat down to brainstorm it. And within a 24-hour period, I had written all 52 things I was going to write in the cards. Wow. Nice. And I I liked what I said I thought I wish somebody would have said this stuff to me in the process of going through that that first year and then as, as a writer I thought I've got an outline there you go and I was able to get an agent right away I got the book written we've got a contract and here it is and it's it's my my intention to help provide comfort and support um, and love and happiness to as many people as I possibly can who are dealing with grief and loss. In your experience, um, I had a friend who, who said to me, because, you know, it's always like, well, it's been nine months. It's been, you know, this is what yeah. I would say. I would say this. Yeah. I would say it. And she looked at me, she goes, why, why are you saying it's been nine months? Why are you saying it's been the next number of months? I said, because it's, a, it's not so much about, it's not so much about them being gone it's about i've survived this mm -hmm. i have made it this far and she's like oh okay because she didn't quite understand she's like why you know she's like i'm not i'm not saying it's wrong i'm just curious why do you say it's been why do you keep marking it? it's like because it's you know it's a big deal because you especially when you've been with somebody john and i were together 16 years so when you have that that partner for that long being without them is like you've cut off your leg or your arm, you're, you're missing something. And so you you have to learn, you mark it with, I've, you know, it's been, and it's about survival. I don't think it, I think that's why most women or most people that lose their spouse or even their parent, usually it's a spouse, will sit there and say, it's been X number of years, X number of months. And then X number of years and mm -hmm. as it goes on, because it's, it's always kind of in, in that, frame of reference and it's okay mm -hmm. and somebody you can tell that to me and I understand exactly what you're saying and you can tell it to somebody who hasn't lost somebody close to them and they won't have a clue right. I've, I've heard so many sad things about like somebody going returning to work after their two-day bereavement leave and having the, the boss being upset because she was teary it's like <laughs> It, like they aren't you yeah. over that yet and you, you get that from so many people you know um my 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 stepmom died they were they evacuated for katrina and my stepmom died and the reason i'm saying this is it's right up there um my dad had his mom who was 89 at the time and so my stepmom died from a pulmonary embolism in my dad's arms and mm. He was a retired fireman and he saved people. So this was really, really bad for him. So she died in the middle of the night by about seven o'clock the next morning. My grandmother, who she was a pistol. That's the best way my husband would describe her. Slaps my dad on the back and says, Donnie, sometimes you just got to get over it. Oh, wow. <laughs> and so I tell my dad, I'm like, you know, you can send her up here. No, 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 we're fine. I think it was about three weeks later and my other grandma was coming up here anyway. I'm like, you pick up my other grandma. Cause he's like, I can't handle it anymore. You have to take her. You just have to take her. I'm like, okay. But I mean, to say that, and she had gone through grief. She lost my grandfather, but I I'm like, and I know grief is a sensitive thing. It goes back to what you were saying about people don't know how to say things to you. They don't know what to expect. And I've, I've noticed that. Yeah initially and this is something for anybody that's listening everybody's there everybody is there right after it happens everybody is checking on you making sure you're okay and then as time goes by there's nobody except the people that you are really close with to begin with but everybody else has kind of fallen off and nobody checks in and nobody makes sure you're sure you're okay they don't they don't doesn't it's fine life goes on and that's fine life is supposed to go on but just 
maybe don't rush in. Maybe just check in occasionally. That's that's so important. I hear that more than anything else that that people are so alone. I, I know I was really alone in with the shock after 22 years of living in the same community. We were very active in the community. Uh, we, I always thought I'd, I've got to, you know, get dressed before I go to the grocery store because I know I'm going to run into people I know I, always. It was it was that sort of a thing. And we knew so many people. And when we had his service, I couldn't believe how many people were there. He was he was really loved in the community. And then after like a couple of days after the funeral, everybody was gone and nobody was around. Nobody invited me anyplace. Nobody wanted to go with me anyplace. It, after a while, a friend of mine who had lost her husband uh, about six months before mine contacted me and we started seeing each other a little bit. And then one of his doctors, ironically, who, who we had uh, known for the whole, he was, he was a research physician in the cardiology group. Um, we talked a lot through the whole process. He wasn't actually Jacques' doctor. He was just somebody that we met because we were there and mm -hmm. they had really interesting conversations. And he called me and he goes, you know, I, I know how involved you are in the community and I know you would probably like to be going to things. And if you ever feel like you don't want to go someplace alone, I would be happy to escort nice. you. Nice. And it wasn't, it wasn't a romantic thing or anything. It was just very, very nice. And I took him up on it and, and I was, I was really grateful for that. But when we would go someplace, <laughs> the things that happened were awful. You know, I, I would, uh, and we weren't like holding hands or standing close or showing anything mm -hmm. that there was any kind of relationship there. It was just two people. And I heard one evening, these people that had, had smiled and said, hi, how are you? That sort of thing. And then walked off and you go, can you believe she's dating again? Jacques only been <sighs> dead for a few months. How could she be dating again? And wow, I, it just, it blew me away. Well, and that, that's the interesting thing about it is, is there a time limit? Is there some kind of time frame that says, hey, okay, it's okay to date now? You know? Uh, I don't think there's a time limit. I think it's it's whatever you want to do whenever you're ready to do it. I mean, and I'm not asking, I mean, it's, for me, I, it's not a big mm -hmm. deal, but it's just one of those things it's like, who has the right to sit there and say, well, you can't date yet. Yeah. I mean, John told me from di way before he died, he was like, You're, I, want you, I don't want you to be alone for the rest of your life. And it's just kind of like, yeah, nobody's going to follow up on you, dude. You know? Um, and, and the thing is, when I look back, and I don't know about your experience with Jacques and stuff, I knew John, it was coming for John because he's making me do things like clean up the room, uh, get rid of his old clothes that he doesn't need. And there was a shirt the day before. And it said, fear me for I have the power to destroy you. It was a joke. And I walked in the bedroom and I'm like, I had already told him the day before. I'm like, I feel like you're already gone. I don't like doing this. He's like, you gotta do it. I'm like, all right. So I bring him the shirt and I said, do you want this? He goes, no. I said, why not? He goes, I don't have that power anymore. Oh, wow. And I, I look back at that day and it's like, I put the, the shirt in the thrift bag. I dropped it off that morning. And now I just look back and go, wow. Did he know, you know, did he really, really know, um, back to the, to your point though, about people I've had girlfriends. I mean, they're like, what are you doing for Thanksgiving and Christmas? I'm like, nothing. I'm staying home. No, no, no. I don't care if there's a pandemic, you're coming to the house, you're coming to my house. So I had people, my, my good girlfriends that have been around for a long time, they've stepped in, they've stepped up and said, come on, you're not, you're not doing this by yourself. It's just the other people that I thought might be there weren't there. So, yeah, the holidays have, have always been a, a challenge for me. I know uh, Jacques and I started when when he was acting at the melodrama. It was a, a local sort of professional theater where they had actors from out of town come in and stay for weeks or months doing performances and they would fill in some gaps with local actors and everybody loved Jacques so he was always getting asked to perform out there and so we were always having people over after the show so to, we had a pool and spa and stuff and it was we were the place to go and so when holidays would come up there would be these actors that had no family around so we'd always 
ask them and then that extended out to people to, who know other people who didn't have any place mm -hmm. to go and and we always had these uh holiday gatherings with people that didn't have someplace else to go and and we always had a ball and so after after shock died and the holidays came i was expecting somebody to invite me to go someplace and nobody and did. nobody did sorry and it that for the first couple of years holidays were were miserable for me it wasn't that i wasn't functioning it was just you'd get to the the holiday and think doesn't anybody care yeah and i think a lot of times it's that they they can't bear um to see your grief they they can't bear to see you because you remind them of their love for the person who died and they don't want to deal with it especially in public and at holidays when they want to be happy so through no fault of your own you're excluded and and it's a challenge so since since i went through that experience i've made a really big deal of having anybody over who wants to come over yeah. when it's holidays you know we just get get people together and here on the island I, we have quite an eclectic group of people and we just have a ball and many of my friends here are musicians and so we a lot of times they'll have to play on holidays or um so we'll do it like the the monday before thanksgiving we have what we call friendsgiving and it just everybody gathers and i think it's if if somebody doesn't seek you out like they weren't seeking me out to invite me someplace i ended up creating my own and i i think that that's a, that's a healthy way to do it you know because it, you're it's kind of giving people permission to go, oh, she's okay, we can be around her now. How hard was it for you to find your space, your purpose, where you belonged? I mean, did you, were you teaching still at the time? So you had that to fall back on or? Well, after shock, it was a challenge because I had, I had taught for, at the university for many years and I stepped away from it uh, because I, I had this passion for theater. I had it always, one of my degrees is in theater and I wanted to create a theater and school of arts and espresso bar that turned into a cafe that turned into a catering company and the lobby and the theater turned into an art gallery and it just, you know, just blossomed and kept bigger and bigger and it was, it was fabulous and I absolutely loved it. And about two years before Jacques died, I went to the foundation that we had set up when the, the, the theater was not a nonprofit, but we set up a nonprofit foundation. I, asked all my friends if, if they would be interested in doing this and they did it to provide uh, scholarships for anybody who wanted to take, especially children who wanted to take classes at the theater and, and didn't have money to go because I, I didn't want it to be an elitist thing. I wanted it right. to be for anybody who was interested. And they've done a, a wonderful job of doing that and getting grants for like classes for foster kids and doing doing lots of neat things so I was, I was really thrilled with what they were doing with that but i i went to them the the person that i told you that was the widow whose husband had died a few months before i was uh had become the president of that foundation yes. and i said i, I want to come to your next meeting i need to talk to everybody and tell them what's going on and i said i just can't do this anymore. I'm, I'm spending so many hours in the hospital. I'm trying to do pain roll on my computer at his hospital bedside, having people come to the waiting room at the hospital to have meetings. I said, this, this isn't fair to anybody. And I'm sure that the theater and everything is suffering for it. I said, if I give all this to you as a donation, the, the theater, not, not the cafe, because a friend and I, and I did that together. And so she took over the, the cafe and that was, that was hers, but all the rest, the, the school and the theater and the gallery, they said, if I give it to you, will you accept it? And will you take care of it? And they said, yes. So I had walked away from that, my passion, two years before he died. And by the time he died, they were doing just fine on their own. And it wasn't really appropriate. I'd come in for a couple of things, like they gave me a founder's award and Mm -hmm. I, I go down to the cafe and do dishes for him sometimes just to, to be involved, but I couldn't get anybody to be interested in having me around because it, it was like 
they didn't want me to think I could take over again, yeah. even though it was mine and I created it. It was it was their thing then. So I really had to step away. And fortunately, one of my friends that I had taught with at the university had come to, well, actually several, several of them, to Jacques' service. And about a, a week, two weeks later, she goes, we really need you back at the university. Would you please come back and teach writing again? And nice. I don't know what I would have done had she not done that i really really don't know what i would have done but i was i was grateful to be able to go back to that i think that's that's one of the things they don't you know if you have something else in your life you can distract yourself but that's the whole thing it's a distraction it's not that you you've handled your grief it's not that you're mm -hmm. you're 100 percent okay it's that you have that distraction um the one thing i because i i do read cards on the side I've dealt with a lot of clients that are like, oh, well, my husband handles everything. And this is before John ever passed. And I'm like, you know, you, what are you going to do if something happens to him? What are you going to do if, you know, he gets in a car accident and he's not there to take care of the bills? Well, I don't know how to handle that. The one thing I try to stress to a lot of people, and I mean, this could be a woman handling all the bills and, and the say, you know, either way, it doesn't mm -hmm. have to be a woman, but the fact of the matter is you need to, when you're a partnership, you need to make sure you're a partnership. And if bills aren't your thing, that's fine, but make sure you know where all the passwords are. Make sure you yeah. know what's in the bank account. You know, fortunately I knew all that, but I, I see so many women because I see so many women that are just like, oh no, no, I'm fine. But the fact is you're dealing with grief and then you're gonna have to, besides dealing with grief, kind of what you were describing with your friend, you have now all this other stuff to handle and if you haven't dealt with that before what are you going to do how are you going to pull yourself out and how are you going to avoid being scammed that's right and and just anybody in general not somebody I'm, this this goes to everybody people you love like for instance your parents um, make sure that you have an understanding of what they want to happen what, what your loved one, anybody you're close enough to, to be potentially making decisions before, make sure you have the conversations. My, uh, my dad died suddenly and my mom just kind of wasn't functioning for most of the rest of her life. She, she never smiled again. Mm -hmm. She just was, uh, was not happy. And both mom and dad were always very private about their finances and about the company that they owned together. And when dad died, I took his, his place, his seat on the board for the company. So I was beginning to learn about the company. But even with that, mom wasn't letting the people on the board know what was going on with the yeah. company. And the uh, guy who was, was, had taken over running it from dad had learned from dad to not tell anybody your business. And so it was, it was a, a real mess. So trying to step in when, when mom got to the point where she, she couldn't handle anything for herself. And I went into her desk and I was, I, I don't know why people hadn't come to arrest her for not paying bills, you know, <laughs> cause she, she had just not, she'd given that up maybe a year before. And it, for some reason, her lights and her water and everything was still on, but I had lots of back payments to do. At, at the time, she liked those Reader's Digest condensed books. There was probably four years worth of a pile of unopened boxes from them and overdue bills from them saying you're not paying for these books, but they kept sending them to her. Uh, there, there were just all kinds of things. And it's just so important. Tell, tell your somebody, more than one person is important. Tell them where your will is. Tell them where your durable power of attorney is. Tell them if you want to be resuscitated or not, whether they want to hear it or not. My daughter wasn't, doesn't want to hear about any of that stuff. My son knows all of it. My daughter's an attorney. <laughs> tell her the stuff anyway. <laughs> yeah, yeah want to discuss it she'll like okay that's enough so it you're doing such a disservice to people you love when you don't have those conversations those conversations are so important well and here's an interesting thing so you have children mm -hmm. for me i don't 
So, you know, then as soon as your spouse passes, then it becomes, well, who's now you're in case of emergency? Well, my parent, you know, my dad's still around. So yeah, he can be, but he lives in New Orleans. So who's my, who's willing to step up and take responsibility for me? Um, so that's a whole nother caveat. And then, and then of course there's the, the word widow. Mm-hmm. I, I, that bothers me. And I'm, I know some people it's okay. I don't think that, I mean, I love John, but when I got divorced, I was single again. I didn't sit there and wear it as a badge. And I'm not disrespecting John because I don't want to be a widow. Widow mm-hmm. just sounds so dark and depressing and lonely and like, you know, don't ever touch her. She's been widowed. Her heart mm-hmm. will never, I mean, it's, but it's not the case, but yet it goes on your car insurance. It goes on your taxes. It's just because I love somebody. I'm. Yeah. Mark. I'm I'm always grateful when they've got the op- option for single. They, yes. they have widowed, but they also have single. And, and when I can mark single, it, it makes me, makes me feel better because yeah. I'm, I, I'm identified as me as opposed to being identified as, oh, that poor widow. Yeah. When, when John died, my doctor had just changed practices into a different uh, group. And they're like, so marital status. I'm like, I'm widowed, but I'm not happy about it. And I'd rather be single. She's like, okay, we'll mark you single. I'm like, perfect. And, and it's just, you're trying enough to find your own identity. You don't need something else labeled on you. Like, here you go. Mm-hmm. And, and like I said, it's not a, it's not a very pleasant term. Mm-mm. It's because then connotations well then you got black widow you remember the mm. whole you know the woman that's married and you know it's like no just carry it on it's not it's not supposed to be that way um in your experience do you think that you've recovered and would you i guess maybe the big question is would you be willing to fall in love again going through all of this well my belief is that everything is love. Everything is based on love. Everything I do, I do because of love. <clears throat> I love to help people. I love me and I want to take care of me. Yet, having been through not the experience of loving my husbands, but the experience Absolutely. of watching them leave over a prolonged period of time, I'm not sure that. I want to put myself in that position again. I, I found myself in the same school of thought. And I mean, I'm, I still possibly have half a life to live, you know, and cleaning out his clothes. It, I don't know that I want to be in that situation again. Yeah. I, I don't know that I do. I, I would like to have friends. I love to have good conversations with people. Mm-hmm. If if uh, if I could hang out with a guy or more than one guy to just have somebody to it doesn't have to be a guy I go with my girlfriends now but it, guys seem to to shy away a little bit from from the widow thing that uh, I I would love to be able to just go for a walk on the beach or have a cup of coffee I, I there was a guy for a while that we'd go for a beach walk every couple of weeks um, and he wasn't much of a talker. So we were just kind of mostly just yeah. going for a beach walk and coming home. And I, I just loved being out, not by myself. I don't have to have romantic involvement. I just like it's, to uh, be with someone or be around someone. It's the companionship aspect of mm-hmm. it. And, and I think that's the hardest thing because let's be honest, after a certain point, because of our spouse's health issues, you, it was about companionship and there was mm-hmm. intimacy in different ways other than sex. Um, maybe I'm speaking, I shouldn't be speaking for you, but I mean, that's the case when you're dealing with somebody that's chronically terminally ill, you're not having rip roaring, let's go pull our clothes off. So mm-hmm. it becomes you're with your best friend, you're with your companion and you're, you have intimacy, but it's a different type of intimacy. Yes. And it's rewarding. Mm-hmm. But then it's really hard when it's gone. Yes. So, you know, I mean, people are like, well, you got, I, I remember, and I've talked about this, I think one other time we were at a fabric store because my husband used to sew on occasion 
and this woman was following us around Joanne Fabrics. She was following us down the aisles, and I'm like, what is she doing? And then we go to another aisle, and she'd come down the aisle, and she'd stand there and watch us. And I was like, all right. So we were in the checkout line. She's in front of us. And I'm like, you know, I didn't say anything. I just looked at John. And she's like, I just have to tell you to something. I'm like, okay. She goes, you remind me of me and my husband. She goes, I look at you, and I see pure joy and pure love. And you guys are so adorable and so lucky to have each other. Oh, wow. and I mean, I'm like, I mean, that I was just like, oh, thank you. But that's why she was following us. She's like, I just, oh, wow. I'm sorry if I was scaring you, but I just, I, I had to watch you guys because it was just so beautiful. I was like, okay, how do you replace that? You, you yeah. can't, you can't. So yes, I'm a pile of uh, mess here. Anyway, yeah. <laughs> so writing your way through grief. Um, and that's like a course you kind of have created because how successful has it been? I mean, do people finally say, oh, I've graduated or do they continue on and on? And No, I have this, this, um, the class that I do on Zoom is different than what we did when we were meeting uh, on, on the island on ground. The people, when we were meeting in person, um, it, it kind of kept growing. You know, people would come and go through it. You know, they, they'd mm -hmm. feel like they'd did, wanted to move on to something else but it was it was always kind of an ebb and flow and it was fine online i've been having a, with this uh writing together through grief on zoom class that i do on saturday mornings it's not really a class it's just a, a group for an hour every saturday morning it, it's at uh, 11 hawaii standard time if anybody wants to join you can email me through my website and i'll send you a link because it's, it's just something free and something to do and I have kind of a core group of people, but the whole core very rarely is all there at the same time. And then new people float in and out because either it's, they're not ready for it or they, they're not comfortable with it or they love it and they, they get as much as they wanted to get from it and they're ready to do something else. But the kind of core group that I've got, are, they're wonderful people. And we just, we learn so much through the writing that they do. And then they, what they really like is talking about it afterwards. I was concerned when I started doing this about grief in particular, that people wouldn't want to share what they wrote, that it would be private. And, and I always told them, I respect that. If you don't want to share, you never are expected to share and don't, you shouldn't feel any pressure to share. And generally even the people who said oh i'm not going to share and they said that out loud by the time everybody else had shared they had to share too and they get so much from sharing the experiences of what they're getting from the writing and generally by the the end of the sessions on on saturdays the people are just like i'm so glad i came and this meant so much to me and i haven't done something like this particular thing before and i'm so glad i've dealt with it now and it it's just really great so i i in, really encourage people to do that sort of thing but if if you don't have a group and you don't want to come online to do something like that you can like go to my book and at the end of each chapter there's something good that you can do they're not all writing exercises there are other things too that are related to whatever the chapter is about and i i think my my best advice is to do something yeah. find something don't don't just sit and um for me, I could, I was good at throwing myself a little pity party when I needed to, <laughs> but that's, that's not particularly helpful. So if, if you can find things to do that can help you on your, your way to, to learning how to, to move forward with your grief, then that's a good thing. Well, one thing you touched on there, you know, coming from dealing with somebody that's been terminally ill or chronically ill, you you have to suddenly find a purpose afterwards and it's very easy when you can't find that purpose to go into that hole mm -hmm. that hole of okay so where do i fit in where do i belong and conversations you know you we touched upon this a little while ago conversations you don't know how to talk to people it's like it becomes this kind of foreign thing because you don't want to be debbie downer but you just want somebody to understand and most people don't and and, and it's, it's wrong I, I had a moment where I have a friend who I know online and she had lost her partner they had had some problems and she had lost she he wasn't living at 
with her at the time that he passed. And she felt very grief stricken and that's fine. And she had her mom who would come and check on her and she has her son that lives there. And she was talking about feeling alone. And I admit that I was wrong, but I was alone. I didn't have anybody here with me. And I, she's sitting there saying how lonely she feels and how alone she felt. And it was just like, how can you say you're alone when you have people there? And I get being in a room full of people and being alone, I do. But at the time in my grief, it was just like, I, you don't understand. You you have somebody there. It's a warm body. It's somebody that's still in that house with you. Yeah. And I, like I said, I, I admit now looking back that I was wrong and I'm still friends with her, but it was just one of those things at the time it was like, you lash out because somebody is sitting there they're lucky enough to have that support system i guess that's where where my anger mm. came from so um go ahead yeah, well just uh, that anger is not not an unusual thing and and it's okay to recognize it and and deal with it because it it uh, it's going to pop up Oh, yeah. there's there's going to be situations where it will pop up and if you if you try to be all Pollyanna about it then you just won't ever deal with it and it'll just keep festering until you do deal with it and and that's the thing about grief it's it's something I mean it took me years to deal with my mom's you know my mom my mom's suicide which is a whole another caveat of grief but it still takes you years to process it because suddenly that person is not there and I mean that's a whole and we can touch on that real quick because you're dealing with grief anyway when you're dealing with suicide you're dealing with well why did they reject me what did i mm -hmm. do wrong what what was so awful about their life that they did this and you have a lot to process and a lot to unpack and, and it's a different type of grief than dealing with somebody that's terminally ill it, it really is and and I hate to say this, but there seems to be a real upswing in su suicide. Um, I'm sure some of it's pandemic related. I've heard especially teenagers having having difficulties with, with having to not ever be around anybody. And that was how they dealt with it. Uh, but it, it seems to be happening more and more and having people come to me more and more and it just to me, it emphasizes the value of interpersonal relationships that you just have to have somebody. Sometimes people will, will write really long things just to me because they, they wanted somebody to read it. It wasn't that they wanted, they didn't want to talk about it and have a discussion. They just wanted to get it out. And, and by having somebody read it after they wrote it down, somehow validated their experience for them. So it's, it's really, really important. But these, these uh, people who are survivors of uh, a suicide death are, are really struggling right now. I, I have quite a few people contact me about that. Well, and, and it's unusual. Well, I was gonna say too, in the pandemic, just in general with, with death with the pandemic, I mean, whether it oh, be yeah. somebody that actually died from it or not, just the whole way we've, we've handled it. I mean, when you think about grief, under normal circumstances prior pre-pandemic you you would have the wake or the service and the, you know you'd have your little celebration if you were going to do that your irish wake however you were celebrating it that that took place within the first week everything was handled everybody everybody had their bereavement even though you didn't it was all handled right then and there you didn't have to go okay so i've moved all the way over here now and now we can open up everything so now let's do this thing so you want me to come back from here to there? And I think that's a lot, it's a lot harder. You know, how do you, you don't have everybody at the hospital either. That's the other thing with the pandemic. Yeah. Yeah, you don't have that support. My best, my husband's best friend came to the hospital. He was the only one that came and it, he had to be approved. I had to put him on a list. And what was funny about it at the time, and it's not really funny, but so you walk into the hospital, you have your mask on, okay? We need you to take your mask off and put this one on. <laughs> what? 
Yeah, yours isn't good enough. <laughs> that always when, bothers me. Mine is a better quality mask, but you want me to put on this? Okay. So I, I just, I think the pandemic, I think it's changed how we grieve a lot because mm -hmm. you don't have the support like you used to. And like you said, with suicide, I'm sure that's even worse because now you're questioning it. And, and I had a therapist tell me right after my mom did it, that you're more predisposed if you know somebody that's done it. I don't know that that's necessarily true, but I guess in some cases it is. And especially now, if kids don't necessarily have the hope we did, they don't have all that interaction yeah. that we did. I mean, come on. Yeah, and, and saying something like that to somebody is, you know, because it, it plants a seed for you. He did it. And he did it to my grandmother. If you and water it, he did it to my mother and my grandmother. Like the first appointment after my mom died, and I'm like, I, I never went back to him because of that. I found a different therapist because it's like, how dare you say that and put that? I'm trying to get my grandmother into therapy, which didn't work, but so she could mm -hmm. help deal with it. And that's your response. Um, but going back to the teenagers, it's like you know when we were younger senior year you looked forward to you know your prom you look forward to all these fun things and it's like no sorry can't do it and i don't know if we'll ever get back to totally normal i don't know that's that's a hard one to it's just speculation mm -hmm. nobody knows no um so your book is nice bit, but i'm not sure yeah. if where we were before is where we want to be <laughs> yeah no, but yeah. I think that there's a lot of divisiveness now and a lot of expectations on how you're supposed to act. I actually have a, mm -hmm. I'm releasing an episode this week about expectations. And the, this gentleman had a, written a book about, ex, you know, ex, managing your expectations basically. And I think that's something that none of us are taught how to do. We're always taught anything's possible for the most part. And it's not, take it slow. We, we definitely have turned in with social media to become instant gratification. Mm -hmm. And that's hard to manage your expectations if one day you have this big hit and the next day you don't. That's right. So your book's available on Amazon, correct? Amazon, any place where it's traditionally published, so you can get it any place that uh, books are sold. Okay. Are you going to write a follow-up? It's an interesting question. I already have uh, <laughs> because it, I mentioned it's 26 chapters. Yeah. I had written a 52, 52 chapter I, book yeah, yeah. and it signed a contract for it with the number of words that I had written in the 52 chapters. It was all, all you know, that was the way it was. And they sent the manuscript to the editor that was assigned to it. And she contacted me and she goes, well, this is way too long. Do you want my people to, to cut it or do you want to cut it? And I said, what are you talking? Cuts how much? And she told me the number of words I said that's half the book <laughs> I said that's not okay so she said well think about it and get back to me so I thought about it and I thought that's half the book so that means I have one book now and I could have one book later so I contacted him and I said since we already have a con contract for that number of words let's publish the first half now and then when it, it gets up with it on its legs and stuff we can publish the second book is uh, an, another book so it's it's already written <laughs> okay okay i just you know I, I i figured it was something along those lines because it was like i remember you saying 52 and i was like well the book has yeah. 26 <laughs> so that makes sense um so you're still teaching uh well i was until december and i i have taught online for many years and I live in Hawaii and taught in California because I, I retired from that position a long time ago, but everybody liked my online writing class. And so they kept hiring me back to teach it. And I kind of thought last fall, I wouldn't be coming back because it, it's on a, a term to term contract with me since I'm retired because I figured their enrollment would drop. Well, it didn't, their enrollment increased. And so I taught in, in the, uh, fall and then I had my class all prepared for spring semester and on Friday before the Monday class started they contacted me and said our enrollments have tanked and we don't have enough students to be able to to have the class wow 
So I was really surprised. Then in the meantime, I was getting things about, well, when you come back in the fall and stuff, and I said, for some reason, I haven't gotten a contract yet. So mm -hmm. I contacted the school and said, what's up? And they said, well, we're trying to figure it out because apparently when they, the whole state university system went to online classes suddenly, um, like in March of last year, everything had to transition yeah. all of a sudden. Um, a lot of the people that were teaching in California took it as an opportunity to move to wherever they wanted to and teach online from there. And the state decided that they didn't like the idea of their employees that were working for them not living in the state. Oh. And so they, they said they're working on trying to figure out what they're going to do about it. And I told them, well, remember, I still pay taxes in California. Anything I earn in California, I'm still paying taxes. So if that's what they're concerned about, they, they yeah. don't need to be concerned about that. But I still haven't received a contract. So I kind of assume that that, that career is, is finally done after all these years. And it's OK, because I love what I'm doing now. I love teaching those classes. I'm passionate about it. But I also very much love what I'm doing now with, with helping people deal with grief and loss and finding happiness. And that's, that's an important, I mean, it's not only bringing you happiness if you're helping others. I mean, seeing their way through a dark time that's a gift it's a gift um the podcast you know back to this podcast where it was all because somebody had asked me a question about what was my fear and my fear was losing my husband and so i talked about the better two moment of telling him that and it was just something clicked that was like you know instead of just writing because that's what i do a lot of times do the podcast everybody keeps telling you to do a podcast so it's like okay and what I've learned is I'm helping other people from it because people listen to this, somebody that's going through grief or somebody's listened to a, the story about somebody being an alcoholic or just trying to go after their goals. And I realized that, you know what? I'm helping somebody. And that, that is rewarding in itself. If, if sharing this moment with you, this open conversation, this real conversation with you helps somebody else that's dealing with grief, then both you and I have achieved something great because yes, they can reach out to you and take the Zoom class. They can reach out and maybe just start writing their own feelings down. Mm -hmm. And that, that's a gift. So I agree. I will, I, all of your links, your website is loving and living your way through grief.com. Mm -hmm. And I will have all the links. I'll have links for your books and everything in the comments. Thanks guys for tuning in to the better Two podcast. Your listenership is greatly appreciated. If you like what you hear, remember to hit subscribe. We also have our videos on YouTube. They usually post the same day as the podcast, and you should check it out. If you have a question or you would like to be a guest on the show, please drop me an email, and I'll be glad to talk to you about it. The email is Donna, D-A-U-N-A, at thebetter2podcast.com. Thanks again for tuning in, and catch you next time.